Every week that goes on, I lose money. My business personally is millions. It's negligible. It's gone. Australia is in the deepest downturn since the Great Depression. A well, worst case scenario would be we will lose our house or lose our uh, shop. It's been crushing. The economy is being kept alive by unprecedented government spending. Raising that anxiety again of how I'm going to actually pay the bills, how I'm going to feed my child, you know, it's... Um... Could you survive with JobKeeper cut back? No. As key support measures wind down, will the economy revive or could it get far worse? There's no doubt we're going to see a tsunami of insolvencies. It's going to create such social disruption that I think the governments aren't quite comprehending. Tonight on Four Corners, we take a journey through Australia's COVID recession, looking at how it's affecting people's lives and livelihoods and why this nation is so vulnerable. Dawn breaks over the most easterly point in Australia. Byron Bay is usually a mecca for travellers from across the nation and around the globe. But the border closures have put paid to that. As the sun climbs, dive school operator Perry Bartholomew heads out to a noted dive spot. How many times do you reckon you've done this, Perry? Well, I started driving boats here in Byron in 95, so a few thousand times over the years. Before COVID, he often had three boats out on the water full of tourists. Today, it's just us. How much has COVID affected your business? I was actually looking the other day and we're about between 67 and 78% down, so it's had a massive effect. You now we've got no international tourism, now with the Queensland border and the Victorian borders being shut, so, um, you know, it's going to affect this hugely. Hey guys, there's a whale uh, pectoral slapping just over, over there. Normally, 80% of his customers are travellers from overseas, drawn to the natural wonders of the bay. But that market may be shut out for months, maybe years. Then there's social distancing. Uh, this little vessel can hold uh, 12 customers and two crew, so we can take up to 14. But at the moment? At the moment, we're limited to between six and eight. The reduced numbers rob him of any profit. Uh, well, obviously, I've got a mortgage on my house to, to um, buy the business, and that's, that's still got to be covered. So your house is mortgaged to fund the business? That's correct, yeah. He bought the dive centre with a mate 16 years ago and recently borrowed heavily to buy the business outright. Things were going swimmingly until COVID struck. Well, it's definitely going to be a struggle. We sort of, you know, to this point, we've been using up all the, yeah, the savings and money and everything we've had sort of put away for a rainy day, but it's, uh, it's going to be much more than a rainy day, I think. The bank's got a mortgage over the dive centre he can't afford the repayments. The banks have been pretty good to us uh, over the last you know, few months, holding our, our loans, but they're all gonna still have to be paid at some point in time. Everyone ready? So a man who makes a living taking people underwater okay. is struggling to stay afloat. JobKeeper's been a massive help to us. Uh, without JobKeeper, we wouldn't still be surviving. Currently, we've got 10 workers on JobKeeper, including myself. If we get a combination of JobKeeper being wound back and domestic tourism coming back, then we'll probably be OK. If we lose JobKeeper and we go into lockdown, obviously, if the revenue's not coming in, the um, the bills still are going out, so 
Yeah, if I really want to survive. The dive school is not alone. More than a third of the nation's businesses are on JobKeeper. It's paying the wages of nearly 30% of all employees. And Byron Bay is JobKeeper central. Two out of every three businesses here are relying on it to pay wages. Good to meet you, Simon. Yeah, likewise. Come Thanks for making the time. Simon Richardson is the mayor of Byron Shire, and he's worried. Look, if the government wind back the current payments of JobKeeper and JobSeeker, it'll savage our community. From today, JobKeeper is being wound back. The full rate falls from $1,500 a fortnight before tax to $1,200, then down to $1,000 before it cuts out altogether at the end of March. It's going to be a devastating impact. It's going to create such social disruption that I think the governments aren't quite comprehending. The beauty and affluence of Byron Bay hide an underbelly of hardship. At this wood cabin, volunteers are dropping off food for the needy. Pleasure. All the best. <laughs> Louise O'Connell runs the Byron Community Centre. It used to serve the homeless and the down and out. In the recession, there's a new clientele. We're seeing dozens and dozens of people coming to us asking for help who have never accessed these services before. These are people who are working pre-COVID. Byron's a very expensive place to live. Most people have two or three jobs here just to survive. They might have had three jobs and lost one job. They've never asked for help before and they're actually ashamed. She fears there's worse to come. We don't think we've seen the tsunami that's about to hit. We think once JobKeeper rolls back, people have spent all their superannuation and their savings. We see that we're, there's going to be an absolute tidal wave of need uh, from our community. On the streets, shuttered shops give a hint of the pain. Tourism made Byron Bay wealthy, but vulnerable. I guess it's just like any farmer who's got uh, one crop, you know, if you've got a monoculture and that crop fails or the market drops, you know, the farmer's not left with much else. And so Byron's very similar. <laughs> Singer and DJ Miss Renee Simone has been living and performing in Byron Bay for 17 years. When we meet her, she's setting up to rehearse at the community theatre. First one for a while? It's the only gig I've had since February and I've gotten... Everything has been cancelled up until next February. How does that leave you financially? Yeah, well, I'm on JobKeeper like the rest of the planet. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't... I, I'm just waiting. Before COVID, Renee was running a successful events company. So we employ people from the florists, the caterers, the wait staff, as well as all the entertainers, the, the bands, the fire twellers, the... DJs, dancers, the whole lot. It degraded just in weeks, you know. It was just like week after week after week. It was just, I've, I've spent the first month just fielding calls, trying to figure out deposits and returning money. 60 people on her books are out of work. Many with no access to JobKeeper because they're gig workers and casuals. Renee has a 14-year-old son. Her finances have taken a massive hit. It's a struggle. When, when COVID first started, um, and I frantically rang the different utilities and had all of the 
relevant conversation, conversations to try to, you know, see what we could do to have breaks for payments and things like that. Um, but those things are all now coming to an end and we're getting the very polite letters saying, you know, that period has now ended and we're going to be taking this amount out of your account and I don't, I <laughs> just, I have no plan. She can't afford to pay the home mortgage. It's on hold. I've had a low-level anxiety that's been running now since February. How I'm going to actually pay the bills, how I'm going to feed my child, you know, it's... Um, yeah, I, I, I've, I've been... I've been... Um, I've gone quite... Um, deep into the anxiety of it and had to really work on pulling myself back from that because there is literally nothing I can do. Do I just keep waiting and hoping or is that stupid? As tough as it may be for some here in Byron, there are areas even more exposed to international tourism where the economic fallout is as bad or worse. Across the border in Queensland, the tourist towns on the Great Barrier Reef the Gold Coast, surfers paradise. In the year before COVID, nine million visitors came to Australia, contributing $45 billion to the economy. The Gold Coast airport services Byron Bay to the south and the tourist draw cards of southeast Queensland. It's lost most of the flights that made it one of the nation's busiest hubs. Well, this is an airport you'd normally see 18,000 passengers a day in. Uh, today, it's empty. It's been really hard to adjust to when you consider that this used to be the sixth busiest airport in Australia. And, and, and now, if we can get one or two flights a day, that's considered a busy day. Just follow me. For chauffeur Peter Pappas, the empty airport is a financial disaster. Among those 18,000 passengers a day, there was a healthy market of people hiring limousines for the drive to surfers' paradise. I have business gone literally to nothing, 98%. Everything's just dying at the moment. Since the border closure, there's nothing moving. Cars are sitting still and no one's working at the moment. Before COVID, Peter Pappas was operating two offices and a fleet of vehicles. Full-time drivers, roughly about six or seven, and then we had uh, probably another 20 contractors that we were giving work to. So that's all gone now. Now he can't even cover costs. We do get the job keeper, but it's not enough. It is not enough to sustain the, the business, the vehicles. There's banks to pay, there's mortgages, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. Well, I had another job for a little while, uh, just to, to help pay the bills. But it's, yeah, it's come to an end as well at the moment. So this is where it's going to get interesting now. Basically, after this month, see what's going to happen, where we're at, and is it worth maintaining the business or sustaining the business? Look, there's another shop that closed now. There you go. He takes us through a near deserted surfers paradise. This is the main hub of surfers paradise. Look at these shops here. Their rent here is astronomical. How are they surviving? And on to a luxury hotel. Hi, welcome to the Sheraton Grand Mirage. Come on through. He's putting on a brave face. But for General Manager Keith Massey, the situation is grim. Well, I mean, we're 80% off. We're 80% off uh, if you looked at uh, this month comparable to last year. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a disaster. And then if you look at today, for example, we're at 10%. Uh, typically, uh, this time of the year, we'd sort of be sitting at, uh, you know, 70 or 80. International clientele, and, uh, you know, the Victorians travel north during the winter, so we traditionally right now would be full of, uh, full of customers from Victoria. It's still busy on weekends and in school holidays, but today there seem to be more staff than guests. 
No one's been laid off. The workers are on JobKeeper. The Gold Coast is suffering. We need uh, the borders to open. It's been awful, horrendous. Across the continent, the border closures are having a different impact. Manjimup is a little over three hours south of Perth. It's home to some of the richest farmland in the west. So that over there could be picked now and could be marketed now, but somewhere, so we could start somewhere between the middle of September, going right through to March. Paul Omaday is the Shire president. His son grows avocados, a booming industry in WA which supplies nearly a third of the nation's crop. But there could be a shortage if they don't have enough seasonal workers for the harvest. We've got probably 50% of the state's potatoes and 50% of the state's apples as well. So that means that we just need workers. And when they run into each other, say in December, when you're thinning apples, starting to harvest potatoes, uh, and then har harvesting, or the harvest for avocados will be in full swing by then. We do need a lot of transit workers. There's just not enough backpackers in Australia at the moment. I think we're down about 60,000 from last year. At peak times, Manjimup needs about 1,000 workers, and most come from overseas on special visas. All around the nation, food growers are worried about a labour shortage in a horticulture industry worth nearly $12 billion. Nicole Giblet is a third generation apple grower in Manjima. The family orchards have operated here for 80 years. We've been part of the seasonal worker program pretty much since its inception, so for several years now, and they've just become an absolute cornerstone of our business, and particularly in harvest. Because seasonal workers from overseas were shut out, many of the trees missed their winter pruning. That could mean a poor crop ahead and higher prices for consumers. It is in disarray and it will have impacts on the, the quality of our output for next season, but we'll just have to manage that as best we can and then pick up the pieces next year. The orchards supply thousands of tonnes of apples to the major supermarkets. See, these apples aren't good enough to sell in the supermarkets. How could they not be good enough? With the new harvest season looming, most of the seasonal workers they need are still shut out. Absolutely a fairly dire situation, I'd say, in terms of having the sufficient numbers to cover all the, the produce items. So it can be backbroken. It can be hard on your body. But, like, I think it's just you've got to have that attitude of, you know, I need to get a job done and you'd be prepared to work in any job. I mean, I have... Yasmin Gooch is one of a handful of backpackers staying at the Manjimup Hotel. She was one of hundreds stuck in the area by travel restrictions after COVID struck. When COVID hit, I was on a farm working and then we shut down. We completely, we were locked in. The town rallied, providing accommodation and food to the stranded backpackers. The community support for those people was just totally above and beyond. I mean, goodbye to my diet, that I'm meant to be on. But yeah. So when you've got a community, that makes your life better and we'll put your arm around you and we'll look after you. It's just, you know, you, you can't fault it. You know, there is so much love in it. Now, Manjimup hopes its hospitality will encourage backpackers to return for the new harvest season and that somehow they can find even more workers. That is the whole everything we're here to do. They are everything. They're the work for the farmers. They're the income for us. They're the, lively, the, the, the life to the town. The, you know, up until now, they've been a massive instrumental part in what happens in Manjimup.
Nowhere is the COVID recession hitting harder than Melbourne. Its powerhouse economy virtually extinguished by a second wave and the toughest lockdown in the nation. And few places here are harder hit than Tarnit on the city fringe. It's one of the areas where mass immigration has driven demand for new housing, underpinning the economy. We were full of hopes and ambition and uh, we had a plan in place. Huja Jatwani and Vikas Kumar bought a house in Tarnit after they arrived in Australia with their young children five years ago. It's my passion and uh, from childhood I want to be a professional hairdresser and beautician. I have been working in beauty industry from the last 15 years and uh, it was always uh, in my dream to have my own salon. In Tarnit, they made that dream come true. Me and my husband took personal loan to open a salon. Luckily, we found a very good spot where we wanted it. And uh, yeah, and then after that, we planned it accordingly. And, and, and it's going good. If you look at our Facebook page or anything, you can, from the reviews, you can, you can I make I have 100 out. plus reviews, five star rating. Customers disappeared as soon as COVID hit. Even before lockdown, since March, my business was not, you know, it's really low. When the lockdown was lifted, briefly, uh, we, we realised the business was not there. People were not coming in. The salon has been shut for the best part of six months, but the bills keep coming. They still have to pay rent, public liability insurance, work cover and superannuation for staff stood down on JobKeeper. That's the work cover. She's the one who gets more worried about every bill, of course. I also get worried when we see a new bill. But some, he hide some now. Yeah, I, I stopped stuff. telling her yeah. that okay, and now we have to pay this. This bill is overdue as well. And this bill is overdue as well. I was thinking to take another loan uh, to pay my you know expenses, but uh, last last week I got an email. My uh, my uh, I didn't get any loan now because I already have you know, uh, uh, two loans on my head, so I don't know. The couple's home loan repayments were deferred for six months, but now the bank's written saying payment is due. Oh, well, worst case scenario would be we will lose our house, we'll lose our uh, shop. It is stressful, uh, you can't always show it. Losing everything is not something that anybody, you know, would like to feel like. It's really sad and stressful time because um, I can't explain. <laughs> it's really sad time. Yeah. At a nearby community kitchen, the charity United Seeks is preparing meals for people in need. Today it's vegetarian pasta. Director Govinda Singh says it's struggling to meet demand. When we started this kitchen in May, we used to cook like probably 150 to 200 meals a week. And uh, now we're cooking like roughly around 400 meals a week. So demand is increasing day by day. The Tarnit area is a virus hotspot. For months, recording the highest number of active cases in Victoria. The charity delivers to the vulnerable. The fresh ones are here, so the older okay. ones to the side. So it's great because we can just give them a, a bit of a mixture of things. Um, okay, yeah. so That's a pasta, that's a curry. Yeah. So I'm going to get 60, so I'll have two, three, or six. But the need is expanding from the elderly and the ill to those who've lost work and income. The small businesses, they're running out of money, and uh, the people who are working in those retail industry. Um, they lost their jobs. International students, we used to do casual work. They, they couldn't find a job, so they, these kind of people are struggling. Single parents who cannot send their kids to the kindergarten and they cannot work, so you know, these are the people who are struggling at this stage. 
About 11,000 workers in the district lost their jobs before the second wave of the virus and the harsher lockdown. Community workers are dropping off food packages to more and more people in financial distress. Okay, thank you very much. Have a lovely day. You too. Chris Coggan was stood down from his job as a forklift driver in April, not long after his baby boy Matthew was diagnosed with epilepsy. Yeah, oh, well, they say it comes in free, so we're just waiting for the third thing to come along. So, <laughs> hopefully, yeah, there's no bad news. It'd be better if it's good news. Come in. Rent takes up half Chris's JobKeeper payment after tax. His partner, Juliana, is too afraid to seek a rent reduction from the landlord. Otherwise, if they said, oh, well, we have to move because we're going to sell the house because we can't pay, afford the mortgage, then what are we going to do? The family can't pay the power bills. At the moment, I can't put the money aside. So usually, like every week, we put aside, oh, this is for electricity, $50. And, but I can't do it now. So I rang the company and I said, well, we are struggling, but we're still willing to pay, so that's why I don't get disconnected. And then we're not the only one. Out, out there, it's worse. My parents always said, well, because we are Christian, so it's always said, um, they said, well, don't worry about the, what's going to happen in the future. God never give you anything more than what you can deal with. On one estimate, two-thirds of tenants in the area are now in rental stress. They don't have enough money to live on after paying for housing. And more than a third of home buyers are in the same position. Nationwide, half a million borrowers in financial trouble have deferred their loan repayments. That's nearly 10% of all housing loans. The deferred payments haven't gone away. The unpaid interest is just added to the mortgage. So when the loans fall due again, people will face higher repayments to make up the shortfall. And there are still hundreds of thousands of borrowers who simply can't pay their loans. When the debt relief ends, we will see a wave of defaults and forced sales. And there's a whole lot of new houses being built. With immigration stopped at the border, who's going to buy them? So this is the overall master plan of the site, but you've got the train station here and so right... Access. Anthony Boyd is the CEO of Fraser's Property. It's building a new housing development on the outskirts of Sydney and another in Tarnit. Immigration is obviously a key driver of demand, basically because that population growth is fuelled predominantly by international arrivals and international students. So when you take out that part of demand, what it leaves is just the domestic demand. The government's home builder program of cash grants has boosted sales inquiries at the lower end of the market. But the scheme will only do so much. It's been OK for the last few months, but in that longer term view, there is a risk. We're not going to keep our heads in the sand. We do see that this is a risk for the market in the next couple of years. Without immigration driving demand for housing and boosting consumption, Australia would have been in recession well before COVID-19. It's realistic to say we're looking at a significant impact on jobs in the construction sector and a flow on to economic growth. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, the property industry employs a lot of people across Australia. If we don't have that demand, then obviously the number of houses that need to be built is going to reduce and the people that would normally be out there building houses and building apartments are going to be out of a job. The global city on the harbour has enjoyed a boom as its economy expanded in recent years. Barangaroo, a whole new high-end precinct, now full of empty offices and near-empty cafes. With the recession biting, Sydney City is suffering a real estate downturn. Welcome, Stephen, to level 40 here. As you can see, 
picturesque day here in Sydney and, and stunning views of Sydney Harbour and the view the, the general, is to die for. Yeah, it's in, incredible. I mean, in fact, there's hardly any better views you'll find in Sydney. At the top end of town, the head of office leasing at a major commercial agency shows me a premium space. Could I drive a bargain price for this, given COVID's hit the market? Look, uh, obviously a, a good question, Stephen, and a question we're getting uh, uh, put to us quite regularly these days. I mean, look, the market has changed. The market is evolving. We're very That's lucky. real estate speak for falling. Demand has dropped considerably and we're looking at a peak to trough drop of around 10 to 15 per cent for the average building in the CBD. Catch the sleek new light rail and you pass a growing number of empty offices. Investment bank Goldman Sachs reckons rents here will topple by 40% within two years, worse in Melbourne, leading to a property price crash that will hit superannuation returns and the construction industry. The next stop is Chinatown in the city south was once bustling with foreign students from the nearby campuses. Loss of income from overseas students has plunged universities into crisis. When COVID hit, the university announced that there were course cuts across the board and in my particular department in linguistics, they cut three units. Dr Jagen Doran was employed at Sydney University as a lecturer until July in a field that helps understand how children read. I got an email saying that I was going to lose my job um, and that came with very little explanation other than there was work for you and now there isn't. Staff at the public universities were excluded from JobKeeper. The tertiary education sector is set to retrench up to 30,000 staff. More if you count casuals and workers on short-term contracts who simply won't be rehired. It's been crushing. It's been crushing financially in terms of not being sure what my income will be. Uh, I've had to look for a rent reduction because I simply uh, couldn't pay rent. I, was the main, I am the main breadwinner uh, in my household and I wasn't able to pay rent on the, um, upon, uh, when I lost my job. Uh, it's also been crushing uh, emotionally to work at something for years and years and years in, on short-term contracts uh, and to be told that there would be work for you and then to have that pulled away. Dr Doran's reduced to two hours a week tutoring. Like thousands of academics, he's worked for a decade without a secure ongoing job. Emblematic of a nation with one of the highest rates of casual work in the developed world. In many ways, universities aren't any different to many other areas like hospitality. Uh, they're heavily reliant on casual workers. There is a small core of uh, ongoing and permanent staff, but that core seems to be shrinking, and more and more they're reliant on casual work. And so when a crisis hits, those casuals are dropped. A 20-minute walk away at Darling Harbour is a vast convention and exhibition quarter with state-of-the-art buildings designed to attract global events and thousands of visitors. It's suffering its own jobs crisis. Let's head upstairs and have a look at what's left of the industry, the morgue. The morgue, you're calling it? We are. Ouch. So when things do start Before COVID, in, Karen Austin had a thriving business designing and producing fit-outs for trade shows and exhibitions. But at the moment, there's, there's nothing booked because there's no confidence. It's yeah. very weird seeing the place closed up. This would normally be bustling. Well, this time last year, we would have executed over 100 jobs. This year, we've done 10. We probably would have built over 3,200 square metres of exhibition stands. This year, we've done 100. So you're talking about the non-functioning business, a business that can't sustain itself on, on that level at all. The one and a half billion dollar venue opened four years ago with high expectations. Concept designs by Karen's company used to fill the now empty halls. 
Our last job here was Black Friday or Friday the 13th of March. We all call it Black Friday now. Uh, it was the end of the industry, effectively. How much has this cost you? Oh, millions, millions. My business personally is, is millions. It's negligible, it's gone. And the impact flows right through the supply chain. We employ hundreds and hundreds of people through these exhibitions all year, and they're contractors. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks. And uh, thanks for taking the time to see us. And This factory on Sydney's northern beaches made exhibition stands for Karen's business. Its owner is Phil Dyer. What's been the impact on your business of losing that event's work? It's been devastating. Like we've lost most of our business. Most of our work is gone. Turnover has tumbled from $350,000 a month to about $20,000. Where does that leave you? Leaves me in a, a tricky position because every week that goes on, I lose money and the business loses money. And there's only so long that we can keep the doors open. Pretty much everyone here is on JobKeeper, so they're working three days a week. They can't survive on that type of money. You know, they're literally uh, struggling to survive as it is, and they're reducing the JobKeeper. They've tried to change up, making cabinets and hand sanitizer stands, but it's not enough. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the type of work we're getting, it just can't keep this factory open the way it is. So you're just hemorrhaging money, you're losing money? Yes, every day, every day. Locked up in a warehouse in the city south is another broken link in the same supply chain. Well, here's our coffee machines that are uh, laying dormant. Michael Wilcox's company supplies coffee machines and baristas to big corporate events and was often contracted by Karen Austin's business. We would typically do two, maybe three events a day across a couple of states. And since March, mid-March, I think, we haven't seen a single day's work. He's still got one coffee machine going at the ABC. But his events business was smashed. The year was looking fantastic. We had really strong bookings in early January and February. Bookings sort of between $250,000 and $300,000 on the books, ready to go. We probably would have taken another you know, $700,000, $800,000 worth of bookings across the year. That, that just didn't happen. So you were looking at about a million dollars in revenue and that's fallen to thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. Yes, that's right. That's where we're sitting. Yeah. John Winter runs the industry body that represents the people who rescue or wind up busted companies. He's concerned about what lies ahead. There's no doubt we're going to see a tsunami of insolvencies. Made it so busy you could hear a pin drop in here. Yeah, I mean, we've never had a situation like this. I mean, every desk is empty and it's going to stay that way for the foreseeable future. The tsunami hasn't hit yet. Bizarrely, in the deepest recession since the 1930s, company bankruptcies are way down because the government's allowing companies to trade while insolvent. The measures that the government took back in March to stop insolvent trading actions has had the very positive impact of trying to provide a protection to those businesses. But what it's also done is keep a lot of businesses that are most definitely broke still out in the market and operating. Zombie companies. These businesses are absolutely zombie companies. They're dead, but they don't know it yet. The ABS surveyed companies in July asking what they will do when the government's stimulus is withdrawn. 10% said they expect to close permanently. That equates to about 240,000 businesses. We don't expect it's going to be that high, but even if it's one-tenth of that, that's still three times as many businesses going broke as you would have in any normal situation. 
Harvey, you got a moment? Sure. Yeah, what are you working on? Consultant trading claim. Liam Bailey thinks it could be much worse. He's handled some major company collapses, and what he's hearing isn't good. From talking to lawyers, accountants, financial advisors and other people in the industry, I think that figure is entirely conservative um, and I think it could be as much as double. So in your view, we are talking about close to half a million businesses going broke, shutting their doors? Entirely possible, yes. Fearing a catastrophic increase in company collapses, the government plans to legislate new bankruptcy protection laws for small businesses in the hope they can trade their way out of trouble while keeping creditors at bay. Liam Bailey says that may help some survive, but he's not convinced disaster can be averted. I think that recession is an optimistic term. I think that it's entirely possible that we are heading towards what's loosely referred to as a depression. Depression is a strong word. And it is one that we like to avoid because it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy, but um, it's entirely possible that that is realistically what we're looking at. In these uncertain times, it's tough making firm predictions. Much depends on how long the virus lingers and how much government's willing to spend. But it's hard not to conclude that there's a serious risk of a second wave economic crisis. As companies go broke, Incomes fall and people lose their jobs and lose their homes. At Byron Bay, amid the economic gloom, the sun still shining and the surf still beckons. Hi, welcome to Byron Bay again. My name's Gaz, making sure you guys have a super awesome, fantastic time surfing. Gary Morgan, universally known as Gaz, takes a bunch of wannabe surfers through a safety drill. No matter where you surf in the world, get landmarks. So when you're out there, you know where you are. <laughs> you know, like, I love it, man. I enjoy teaching surfing, like, unbelievably, you know, like, you know, we've owned the business for more than 21 years and I've been teaching since before then. And just the buzz you get with, you know, getting these guys out through these waves and teaching them how to surf and people don't think they can do it, but straight away they're up and surfing and they're enjoying it and learning a hell of a lot about the ocean too, you know? Guys, can I get you to undo the leg ropes at the back of the board, please? So who's had a surf lesson before? Gaz used to employ a bevy of casual instructors. Now I want you to push your right knee and your left knee and your right knee into the board. And now release your hands. Now there's just him and an offsider on JobKeeper. Paddle, 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 chicken wings, banana. With JobKeeper, it's, it's keeping us alive. Um, we're you know, still getting to pay some bills that we need to pay. Business is as flat as the ocean on a day with no swell. Well, mate, it's the first time we've actually had a class for, you know, more than a week. We, you know, used to take backpackers um, from all around the world. Byron Bay was jamming with backpackers non-stop and uh, it's all just stopped. And, um, you know, we're, we're down over 80% in uh, custom where, you know, school holidays hopefully should be OK. We might have a you know, good domestic market coming to Byron Bay, but, mate, yeah, she's stopped. We're at the beach, we live in Byron Bay, so I don't want to whinge too much, but Financially, it sucks. The sun has well and truly set on Australia's world record run without a recession. And expectations of a rapid recovery are fading. There could be some dark hours before the good times roll again.